Hey friends, welcome back to the Dwelling Place podcast. We are so glad that you are joining us today and we hope you're encouraged and inspired as you listen to this week's message. If you've got your Bible, if you turn to John chapter 10, John chapter 10 verses 10 to 11, we're going to read two passages this morning, one from the New Testament, one from the Old Testament. And um, we're going to work through that together. John chapter 10 verses 10 to 11, it says this, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. These are the words of Jesus. The thief comes only, this is his purpose, to steal and to kill and to destroy. I came they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Psalm 23 verses 1 to 6. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. One version says, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want to speak to you this morning from the subject, the Psalm 23 life. The Psalm 23 life. Let's take a moment to pray together, and then we'll dive in. Father, we thank you for your word this morning that is a firm foundation for our lives. God, we thank you. Your word is so significant. We don't just read it, it reads us. And so God, I pray today, would you speak to us? Would you search our hearts? Would you lead us in your way everlasting? I pray for every single person in here today. Would you fill them with joy? Fill them with an awareness of your presence. And God, we just pray for the wallabies. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said? (laughs) So good. A quick show of hands here. Who would say you're the designated driver of your family? Quick show of hands, like when you're going somewhere. Cool, a few ladies throwing their hands up. That's cool as well. You, you, you got to love backseat drivers. I'm the worst backseat driver. This last week, we were able to hire a car, and um, Leah wanted to drive because she loves to drive. And um, I'm the worst backseat driver. I'll just own that. And I, I get really, like, physical. Like, my hands will push across the dashboard. Like, it's this way, it's this way, it's this way. And it's one of the ways we can get into loving disagreements as quickly as possible. Um, because I struggle when I'm not behind the wheel. I struggle when I'm not the one in charge of where we're going and how quickly we're getting there. And just got me thinking, one of my major weaknesses is a backseat driver. But we totally do this with God, don't we? That when we're not behind the wheel, we love to worship God, but invite God in on our vision for our finances, our vision for our life, our vision for our career. And instead of actually letting him be behind the wheel. We love to either cut him off or show him the direction or tell him the pace that we want to go with our life, with our vision, and with our direction. Psalm 23 is a hymn of deep trust and confidence in God's leadership. It's a psalm and a hymn, the writer is David, of deep trust and confidence in God's leadership and guidance. Now, I say that to say, when we sing about trusting God, as we did this morning, what does that look like practically Monday to Saturday? Because it's one thing to say, I trust you, God. And what will happen is we'll say that, but then we'll leave here on a Sunday and we'll do our best to try really hard to not sin for the next six days and then come back to church on Sunday. When really, when we talk about trusting God, what it's saying is at a deep level, Lord, I trust your vision for my life over my vision for my life. Lord, I trust your vision for my sexuality more than my vision for my sexuality. Lord, I trust your vision of pleasure and fulfillment and the longings of my heart more than I trust my vision of pleasure and longings of my heart. It's one thing to say I trust God, but it's another thing to yield deeply 
to the vision that God has for your life, for your family, for your kids, for your future. Psalm 23 is a hymn of deep trust and confidence, trusting God's vision for your life, but then walking away saying, God, I have confidence and I have a resolve and I've made a decision that you are the shepherd of my life. And that's the call of the scriptures from the Old Testament to the New Testament that, Lord, you're not just a life coach. You're not just a consultant. You're not just someone that I seek your like, advice every now and again. It's, Lord, you're the shepherd of my life. You determine the direction. You determine the pace. You determine the focus. Lord, you're the shepherd of my life. And so I just want to ask you this morning, who is the shepherd of your life? I'd love for you just to consider that and pause in that question. In this season... Who is the shepherd of your life? Because if the Lord isn't the shepherd of our life, chances are one or two other things are shepherding us. The question isn't, do you have a shepherd? The question is, who is the shepherd? Who is the sovereign shepherd of your life? Because if the Lord isn't the shepherd, chances are that two other areas are shepherding you. Either secularism, our world, our culture, or yourself that the noise of culture is determining your direction, your formation, or your past experiences, hurt, and emotions are the overarching shepherd of your life. Carl R. Truman says this, the modern self assumes the authority of inner feelings and sees authenticity as defined by the ability to give social expression to the same. What Carl R. Truman is saying in his book, A Strange New World, it sounds really intelligent, that statement. What he's saying is, we're now in a world where how you feel is the truth. That at the end of the day, what true authenticity looks like as defined by culture is that you must express, express, express everything you feel, feel, feel. And if you don't do that, you're not authentic. And so what happens is we live in this world now that is celebrating like, hey, express your darkest hurts and emotions in every way possible. And when you do that, you'll walk in truth. But the scripture calls us to Jesus as defined by truth, as the giver of truth, as the giver of the way, the truth and the life and fulfillment is found in him. And so the voices that push back against us we were talking about it this morning in the, in the prayer huddle that Pastor Doug was leading, that there are things that'll push back on God's vision for your life. And I think there are three big voices that push back against all of us, yielding, making a predetermined decision and a resolve as the Lord is our shepherd. Here are the three voices. The first one is God doesn't care about your season. The second voice is you don't need God to live. I, I, I get enough money, I do well on my own, don't really need God. And the third one is, you can never really know Him intimately. And now that can sound quite real this morning, but I, I know it in my own life, and there are definitely moments where those whispers of the enemy will get in to say, God doesn't really care about your season, Junior. You do pretty good without Him, you got some good gifts, and you can't really know God that intimately. And one of the most powerful but painful revelations we can have is when we come to the point of realizing our own barrenness outside of God. For me, that happened at the age of 19 and continues to happen throughout my life. But the big kind of moment when I came into the kingdom was when I realized like, oh, I've exhausted every option. I, I need Jesus. The disciples had this moment in Luke chapter 22 when they realized their own barrenness, emptiness, insufficiency without God. Luke 22, verses 61 to 62. This is Peter. He was on the Mount of Transfiguration that Pastor Doug was talking about. And he follows Jesus for three years, lives with Jesus for three years, sees the signs, the wonders, the miracles, the literal mountaintop moments is there in Jesus' valley moment in Gethsemane, just a little bit back. And he comes to this point where he has to make a decision and he walks away from Jesus, and it says in verse 61, And the Lord turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. This moment of realizing, oh man, I've walked away. I, I, I'm, not, 
I, I, I'm not enough. I, I, my, my own pride isn't sufficient. Um, being popular and accepted isn't sufficient. Look what happens in verse 62 as he walks away. And he went out and wept bitterly. One of the most powerful but painful moments in our lives that happen over and over again is when we realize our own barrenness away from the good shepherd our own barrenness away from God as the lover and builder and leader of our soul. So if those are the three lies against the good shepherd, here are the three biblical truths that need to push back against those lies. The first one is it's God's world. Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Secondly, we can do nothing without him. Jesus wasn't joking around in John chapter 15 when he said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Like he wasn't joking in that moment. He meant what he said. And lastly, God is for us and we must learn to walk with him intimately. It's God's world. We can't do anything without him. He's for you. And we must learn in the complexity and the chaos of the world and of the church, how to walk with him intimately in community. So I just want to ask you again before we unpack Psalm 23, who is your shepherd? Is the good shepherd currently leading you, restoring you, and building you into the image that he created you to be formed into? I, I take real issue. I hear this, maybe not in Australia, but in New Zealand, this is said all the time. Just be the best version of yourself. I take like real issue with that because I think it's a false vision of who God calls us to be. Because the prophet talks about, even on my best day, my righteousness is like filthy rags. So I'm not actually called to be the best version of Junior. I'm called to be more like Jesus. And we will only step into that when we fully yield, making a predetermined decision that for 2024, you know what? I'm done being my own shepherd. I'm done with Spotify being my shepherd. Instagram being my shepherd, talkback being my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Amen. When the Lord is your shepherd, a few things happen. If you're taking notes, this will come up on the screen. When the Lord is my shepherd, what happens is firstly, I actually have a restorer. I, I can't restore myself. Yoga is not going to restore me. Mindfulness isn't going to restore me. When the Lord is my shepherd, I have a restore, verse two to three in Psalm 23. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Anybody thankful this morning we serve a God that wants to restore us, that cares about what you've been through, that wants to restore your soul to the image that he's created you to become into. The Christian life is two elements, contemplative and active. What happens is, is if we live dualistically, like it's only contemplative, then we don't really walk in the works that God has prepared for us to do in advance. And our works don't save us, but our works are predestined and determined for us to walk into, to reach others, to go, as the event talks about that's coming up, that we're appointed to go. So, But there's a place for contemplative prayer and worship where the noise of our mind and heart can be still, as the psalmist talks about. So we see in the psalm that the Christian life is contemplative and active. He makes me lie down in green pastures, stopping, pausing, reflecting, bringing my mind under submission to the Word of God. Contemplative, but then secondly, active. He, lies, he leads me beside still waters. John Eldridge talks about the three layers of the heart. He talks about how there's the shallows of our heart, the midwaters of our heart, and the depths of our heart. And we're on a journey at the moment in our church context of trying to create environments where people are able to have deep healing and restoration. Because as Christians, we're like the best in the world for living in the shallows. Like you can call like a connect group, like the midwater connect group, right? It's like, how was the footy? Yeah, it was great. Yeah, how's your week? Yeah, on a journey, you know, times are tough, but the Lord is good. And it's like, we kind of, we sidestep the depths. And like, hear my heart, like there needs to be appropriate relationship and context for this. But I just want to like encourage you today that God wants to deeply restore you. That he's not just about changing 
like a little things on the surface, that he deeply wants to restore you, that the things you've been through, the things you're carrying from your parents, maybe some of the trauma that you've faced, that the, the, the heart of the good shepherd is to deeply restore you. And it gets awkward when Christians go through decades without being deeply restored because the same problems and same insecurities that were present at 15 are still present at 50. And it gets awkward. And, and really what happens is the church misses out on having great fathers in the faith because there wasn't a deep restoration that doesn't happen in a moment, but it's a journey of going, God, I'm yielding the depths of my heart to you over and over again. I want to say like this this morning, you can't be deeply restored if you're not deeply yielded. And it's looking at the depths of my heart, not just what I do on a Sunday morning, the shallows, not just what I do on a Wednesday night, the midwaters, but God, like those thoughts, those temptations, those tendencies that I have at a deep level, God, would you lead me in those moments? Would you restore those things? The second thing that happens when the Lord is your shepherd, not only do you have a restorer, but secondly, you have a path. You have a path. Verse three, he says, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now the word paths there in the Hebrew means well-worn paths. And so it's not a new path. There isn't like new concrete laid out for the, for the, for the writer here. It's, it's well-worn paths. And one thing I love about this community is there's such an anchoring in the scripture and those moments of worship. And we've received Christianity. We're not trying to recreate Christianity, Right. Like, like we have an inherited faith from generations that have gone before us. We're not out here in Wynnum and in Palmerston North trying to like create a new Christianity in terms of theology and doctrine. Like we have a received faith that we're called to walk, walk out. And when I talk about well-worn paths, I, I highlight that because there can sometimes be a restlessness in our souls that is like, man, we're waiting for the new podcast. We're waiting for, for the new speaker. We're waiting for the new conference. We're, we're really, the future isn't new. The future is ancient. And, and it's a return and it's a resolve in the ways of Jesus that he's called us to live according to his scriptures. So just like five quick things that are the ancient paths that you and I are called to walk out for the shepherding of our souls. Firstly, the gospel is the redemptive story of our lives. That it's in the day, it's not, I have a story and you have a story. But what happens is when we enter into the kingdom, when we come into following Jesus, when we yield our lives to him, my life is no longer determined by what happened to me. It's reinterpreted through the gospel. That there is now what happened to me with my parents, what happened to me when I was 18 is now redefined and, and re-looked at through what Jesus did for me. And that's the story that we gather around every Sunday. It's the story that we gather about on Wednesday for prayer and group. It's the story that we gather around us. This is what happened to me, but thank God for Jesus, who now because of what he did for me, I can walk on this path. The gospel is the redemptive story of our life. The scripture is the authority of our lives. I don't get to make up the word of God. I come under the word of God. I don't hold on to bitterness, even though it feels good and I might have be justified in doing that, but I, I throw off bitterness because the scripture calls me to. I come under the word of God as the authority of my life. Prayer in the presence of God is the source of our lives. So like my popularity, my, 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 my achievements, they can't be the source of my life. It's prayer and presence with God that really it's, that's my lifeline. Fourthly, the church is the formative community of our lives. And lastly, the world around us is the mission of our lives. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, the renewal of the church will come from a new type of monasticism, which only has in common with the old an uncompromising allegiance to the Sermon on the Mount. It is high time people banded together to do this. When the Lord is your shepherd, you have a path. There is a journey that God calls you out to. And it's not always popular to post on Instagram, but it's the path that's going to restore your soul. Thirdly, when the Lord is your shepherd, you have an ever-present help. An ever-present help. Verse 4 says this, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. I, I want you to catch this just really quickly. 
Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. What happens in this verse and what happens in this moment is the psalmist shifts from talking about the shepherd to to the shepherd. So he's saying, he leads me, guys. He's talking to his church family. Hey, guys, he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, like I'm thankful, God, because you are with me. He moves from talking about the shepherd to the shepherd. And like, I just want to reiterate the missional call in this church. Like we are called to preach the gospel. We are called to reach our colleagues and family members. But there comes a time in your life and every day when really you have to shift from just talking about God to talking to God. And that I want to just like lovingly encourage you today that intimacy with Jesus, one, is possible. And two, it's the heart of God. When the disciples asked Jesus, how do we pray, teach us to pray, Lord, we, we're in this culture of prayer. The disciples' time, like prayer wasn't something that people didn't do. It was a saturated culture of prayer in the Jewish culture. But yet they go to their Messiah, they go to their rabbi and say, Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. I just wonder for some people this morning, like that's a great starting place for the Lord as your shepherd. God, can you teach me how to pray? Lord, can you show me intimacy with you? Can you show us how to follow you? Here's the thing. Most of us struggle to really, in the depths of our heart, we know it's the right thing to say. We know it's the right thing to believe. But I'm gonna go out there on a whim and guess that a lot of us don't really believe that God desires to be intimate with us and that God is present with us in our struggles and in our day-to-day. Generally, we'll either look at it like this, like God's up there somewhere. He's far away. He's distant. He doesn't really care what's happening in my family right now. Like, I love God. I'm in church, but he's up there somewhere. Or, or we think like, like God's like over there. He's, he's really, he's not high and far away, but he's too far ahead. And because of my failures, I can't really get to him. I can't reach him. I'm not good enough. So God's here, but he's like over there with those people. And he's not really present with me. Or lastly, for some people, you're like, yeah, of course God's real, but he's back there. Like he did miracles for me back then. He, I saw salvations and, and miracles back then, but I haven't seen it lately. So ah, he, God's back there. But we just got to remember, like the Bible tells us God, one of his names is Emmanuel. God is with us. And so he's not just distant up there far away. He's not just too far ahead where I can't get to him. He's not old news back there. Best days are behind us. He's God, Emmanuel, God with us. And I just want to encourage you today. He is with you. Whatever valley you're walking through, we talk about his name in December around Christmas time, but God is just as much Emmanuel in January as he is in December. And so I just want to encourage you today, if you're discouraged and weary, and I don't know if God's with me. Yep, praise God, I put my hands up, but man, I'm just struggling to sense his presence. I'm struggling to feel the reality of who he is. I want to encourage you, God is with you. So when the Lord is your shepherd, you have a restorer. You have a path. You have an ever-present help. And then fourthly, you have a comforter. Verse four, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Tozer says this, what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into your mind when you think about God Not what you're supposed to think. Like, what do you actually think? And the truth is, most of us just don't see God as a comforter. So we run to sin. We run to pleasure. Not because we want to, but because it's almost like an escape for a brief moment of comfort. Because we don't really believe that God is a comforter. I love running. I love it so much. And so I'm going to use a running analogy. When we run to comfort outside of God, sin, inappropriate pleasure, what we're doing is we're convincing ourselves, if I take a shortcut here, it'll make the run easier, but it never does. It makes it so much harder. And shame comes in and setbacks come in and then we end up feeling even more distant from God. And really like the root issue, the depth issue is, is the Lord your shepherd? Is he your comforter? God wants to be, your comforter. 
The scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians that he is the God of all comfort. And if you need comfort today, Jesus wants to give you comfort, not just for the shallows, not just for the midwaters, but for the depths of your soul. C.S. Lewis in his book, The Four Loves, touches on this. It says, man approaches God most nearly when he is in one sense the least like God. For what can be more unlike than fullness and need? Sovereignty and humility, righteousness and penitence, limitless power and a cry for help. We come into the kingdom of God in this way. It's, it's a prerequisite for being a Christian. God, I need you. And what happens is as we continue to follow Jesus, we sometimes forget that, oh, I still need you. And C.S. Lewis talks about like, one of the ways that we draw close to God is acknowledging our need for God. Now, Australians and Kiwis, particularly men, we really struggle with acknowledging we need someone else. But C.S. Lewis goes on to talk about this. Every Christian would agree that a man's spiritual health is exactly proportional to his love for God. But man's love for God from the very nature of the case must always be very largely and must often be entirely a need love. This is obvious when we implore forgiveness for our sins or support in our tribulations. But in the long run, it is perhaps even more apparent in our growing, for it ought to be growing, awareness that our whole being by its very nature is one vast need, incomplete, preparatory, empty yet cluttered, crying out for him who can untie things that are now knotted together and tie up things that are still dangling loose. C.S. Lewis touches on like, for some reason, we tend to outgrow our awareness for need for God. When really, when God is our comforter, it's the opposite. As we continue to follow Jesus, we should be becoming more aware of our need for him. C.S. Lewis goes on to talk about the need love and the gift love. And as Christians, we're really good at giving, at serving, at putting others first. And then we forget that our source and our foundation is, oh, I need God so that I can go and give to others. I wanna encourage you today. What comes into your mind when you think about God? And for many of us, I believe He wants you to consider Him and run to Him as a comforter as your shepherd that comforts you. Lastly, when the Lord is my shepherd, I have hope. When the Lord is my shepherd, a few things are gonna happen. Firstly, I'm gonna have a restore. I'm gonna have a path, a well-worn path to walk. I'm gonna have an ever-present help. Doesn't mean things are gonna be easy and smooth sailing. Doesn't mean there's gonna be no pain doesn't mean there's going to be no pressure. doesn't mean there isn't going to be hard days, but I'm going to have an ever-present help regardless of the valley that I'm in or the mountaintop. Fourthly, when the Lord is my shepherd, I have a comforter. And lastly, when the Lord is my shepherd, I have hope. Verse 5 and verse 6 says this, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. And to be thankful we serve a generous God, that God isn't stingy. Really what I wanna do today, and hopefully this is coming across, that I'm just kind of pushing and pulling on your views of God. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What a resolve. Psalm 23 begins with a resolve and ends with a resolve. The Lord is my shepherd. I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. As, as we're in this new year now, four weeks in to 2024, what is the resolve that you need to make? The Lord is my shepherd and hey, come hell or high water, I'm gonna be planted in the house of the Lord. I'm gonna be dwelling in His presence. Things might be hard this year. There might be some frustrations this year. There might be some clouds this year. 
but the Lord is my shepherd. I'm going to be dwelling in his house all the days of my life. Just as we finish, Thomas Merton says this, our lives are shaped by the end we live for. That 40-year plan, that vision board, that five-year plan, our lives are shaped by the end we live for. And what I'm just seeing like across churches in this time is there is like this healthy return to Christians remembering, oh, like the vision of the scriptures isn't just about me having a good life. It's about me being in the throne room of God in eternity. And that w- when my life is anchored as the Lord, with the Lord as my shepherd, and I'm living towards this eternal promise and this eternal truth that, hey, I'm going to be worshiping the King of Kings for eternity. It's funny how the smaller frustrations of our world, we get perspective. And in Revelation 7, verse 17, this is the last book of the Bible. It says this, For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. For the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water. There's not dead fountains. There's not empty fountains. These living fountains of water available to us in intimacy with God and with Him as our shepherd. I just sense for many people today, if you were honest, you would say, you know what? I'm somewhat disappointed with my relationship with God. And I just wanna like lovingly encourage you that you won't be deeply restored if you're not deeply yielded. We can't get angry at God for not getting the benefits that we desire if we're not willing to lay down the depths of our heart. And today, I just sense for some people that there needs to be a deep yielding, a deep resolve to the Lord as your shepherd for the rest of this year and for the rest of your life. Thanks for spending time with us today. To hang out again the next time an episode drops, make sure you subscribe. See ya.